once again, it's great to be back. I see a lot of new faces here, so uh, nice to meet you all. My name's Jake. I'm here with my family. Uh, covering for uh, Brother Russell, and congratulations to him, and I want to say thank you uh, for letting me uh, preach here, Brother Russell, so thank you very much. Uh, the title of my sermon today is The False Religion of Santa Claus. The False Religion of Santa Claus. Now, I had a hard time naming this. I was going to call it The Philosophy of Santa Claus, but that just didn't seem right, and I was going to call it, you know, the consequences of allowing Santa into your house, but that was too long and too wordy. And really, if you think about it, and what I want to show you today is that, you know, believing in Santa is a religion. And the false religion of Santa Claus has a lot of problems. You know, that's a big problem when you, you know, start praying to Santa at nighttime, you know, wishing for more things, and that's a big problem. And in 2020 America, you know, if you look around, there's all sorts of Santa Clauses here and Santa Clauses there. You go into the store and they're singing about Santa this and Santa that. You know, uh, we just went caroling at Tempe, uh, uh, Faith Forward Tempe church location. And, uh, you know, we go and we sing carols to anybody, any house that's decorated. Now, a lot of the houses have Santa Clauses outside. And, you know, we don't know if they're going to be receptive to us singing about Jesus or not. And, of course, they were. But you don't know, and you don't, you don't know if they will or not. Why put a Santa Claus outside? And so we're going to talk about the false religion of Santa Claus today, but let me tell you what the sermon's not about. The sermon's not about, you know, the, the hundreds of child molestations of the local pedophile Santa Claus at, at the local mall that sits, you know, gets hired and he likes to have children come sit on his lap. And if you type in, you know, Santa Claus molestation court case in YouTube, you'll see all kinds of videos, you know, Santa Claus, you know, obviously the physical person at the mall, you know, so-and-so hired a, a pedof known pedophile, a known, uh, you know, a child molestator, and uh, they're hired on to be these uh, Santa Claus workers, you know, seasonal workers, where they come and, you know, kids sit there on their lap and they say, what do you want for Christmas, kiddo, and to get your picture taken. I mean, what a horrible tragedy in the world today, but I'm not preaching on that. The other thing is, you know, recently on, on YouTube, uh, you know how YouTube recommends certain things, certain things that are trending or, or, or happening right now? I recently saw that there was a toddler who was walking with her mom in, in a local Walmart, and there was just some random man who looked like Santa Claus. And I admit, he looked very much like Santa Claus. But this toddler ran up to him and just starts talking to him and starts telling him what, he, what she wants for Christmas and all this stuff, just indulging this stranger in the Walmart. You know, that's not a good situation to have. This sermon is not about the corporate greed and, and culture. You know, give me this Santa. I want this and this and this. Santa, I don't want the blue Porsche. I want the white Porsche or, you know, some horrible problem like that. You know, the first world problems. It's not about that, the greed. Uh, it's not about the perverted Santa songs on the radio. I mean, those songs are, are you know, not for, they're not appropriate. They're, they're, there's some songs out there that are definitely not about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're looking at a deeper idea, the deeper philosophy, the underlying uh, 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 beliefs of having this person, Santa, in your house, Santa in your Christmas holiday traditions. And we're going to look at that and what that means. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, I, I do want to just summarize who is Santa. And for the rare random chance that you're here today, maybe for the first time thinking, who is Santa Claus? What are you talking about? Let me just define it so that we're all on the same page. Santa Claus is, you know, it didn't start out this way, but it's turned out this way now. Santa Claus is a really, you know, very large, jolly man who, you know, flies around the world on his reindeer and, and his uh, sleigh, of course, which we have a lot of sleighs here in Arizona. Uh, he flies around and he leaves presents for all the people. And, you know, if you're good or bad, he has two lists, which we'll get in a second. But he comes down the chimney, supposedly, and he leaves you stuff. He eats your cookies, and then he's off on his way. He's kind of like a giant rodent or something. You know, crawls in your house and eats your cookies. Anyway, that's what I'm talking about Santa Claus. Just to, just to run the same page. That's, that is the, the, the thing that we're talking against. And, you know, on the surface, you might be thinking, you know, Brother Jake, what is this? You know, Santa Claus, come on, give me a break. It's, it's harmless. You know, what's the big deal? And, you know, you could say the same thing about something as, you know, something like Star Wars. A lot of people don't know this. You know, Star Wars is for children, you know, the lightsabers and the action and all that stuff. I get it. But the underlining beliefs there, you know, the Force Awakens, uh, it's a lot of Buddhism. It's a lot of, you know, false religion. It's a lot of, uh, you know, yin-yang mysticism, new world uh, religion. And, you know, there's always some deeper meaning there. And that's what I'm going to try to do today. I'm going to try to peel away... You know, the deeper harm, the deeper problems with 
you know, inviting Santa Claus to be part of your Christmas uh, tradition. We, as Baptists, as Christians, we should be against Santa Claus. And for the record, he is not real. So, uh, number one here. So, Santa's religion doesn't know what a free gift is. You're there in Romans chapter 6. Uh, look at 23, the very last a verse in the whole chapter. Now, this is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And praise God that eternal life is a free gift. It's free. But many people today, you go knocking on their door, you say, hey, God's got a free gift to give to you. You know, John 3, 16, God gave His only begotten Son. And they say, well, you got to be good for it, though. It's like, well, no, it, it's free. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. And they say, no, it's just, that seems too easy. I can't, ex I can't accept that. It's, it's, it, I need to be good. I need to earn this. Where do they get that idea? Well, I'll tell you where they can get it from. I mean, there's lots of places. But what about Santa Claus? What about this idea that you have to be good, young Johnny? You have to be good all year round because Santa's coming. Because Santa's going to give you a reward. You know, he's going to give you a gift. And I misspoke there. You know, if, it's, if you've earned it, then it is a reward. It's not a gift. Wow, I have to be good all year. I'm trying to earn my gift. It makes no sense. A gift is free. You know, salvation is free. Eternal life is free. And people who believe in Santa, well, I got to be good for Santa. I got to be so good. You know, they're obviously trusting themselves. They're trying to earn what should have been free. And it's just a big twisted lie. Let me just show you more about what the Bible says about a gift. Uh, go ahead and flip to, flip one page back to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, one, sh I'm, I'm assuming one page, one chapter back. Romans chapter 5, let's look at verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the simil similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Now we can stop right there, but it says free gift. You know, what's a gift? A gift is free. <laughs> it doesn't say earned gift. It doesn't say as long as you're good all year long gift. It doesn't say, well, as long as you, you know, be nice to your sister gift. Uh, what's, the, what's the song go? Uh, you better not cry. You better not pout. Uh, Santa Claus is coming about. I don't know how it goes. Uh, the free gift. Let's keep reading. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, and much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift, it says it twice, is of many offenses unto justification. What the, this is a, a very uh, a deep uh, section of scripture here. What this is basically saying is that, you know, Adam sinned and their sin entered into the world. And through Christ, by believing on Him in His works on the cross, you can be justified. But the free gift uh, is of many offenses unto justification, saying that your sins are paid for. Christ paid for all your sins. It's a free gift. And, you know, for the soul winners in the room, you know that when you knock on those doors, people have a hard time understanding a free gift. They say, whoa, I've been going to you know, Catholic church for years. You're telling me it's free? Whoa, that makes no sense. That's what the Bible says. It's a free gift. Where did they get the idea that you must earn a gift? Well, a perfect example is Santa Claus. You better be good all year round in order to earn your gifts at the end of the year. It's just not what a gift is at all. I mean, even if you're not even a Christian, that's not what the word means. Let me read for you a few more verses. Uh, one, of a, one of the soul winner's favorites, Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The Bible knows what a gift is. God knows what a gift is. John chapter 4, I'll just read this for you for sake of time. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, this is the woman at the well, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest, ha thou wouldest asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus himself called the gift that he gives, you know, the gift, the eternal life, uh, living water, it's a gift. So right off the bat, and this is obviously very simple for a lot of us here because we understand that it's a gift. But if you're you know, inviting Santa Claus into your house, you're inviting this, this sense of confusion. Well, I have to be good to get a gift from Santa. 
So why would it be different from God? You know, why would it be any different? Is a gift free or do you have to earn a gift? You know, it's this whole confusion. And I'm just saying, get away from it. Just don't invite Santa in. A gift is free. You don't have to earn it. Number two, Santa's religion encourages parents to lie to their children. It encourages adults to lie to children. Maybe it's not the parent. Maybe it's the grandparent. Maybe it's the aunt or the uncle lying to children, telling them that Santa is real. Do you believe in Santa? Now, go ahead and flip over to, go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 in the New Testament. John chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 8. Let me read for you the, uh, Exodus chapter 20. This is from the Ten Commandments. It's Exodus 20, 16. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. That means don't lie. You know, case closed. Don't lie. Well, no, no Santa Claus. Don't lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Revelation 21, verse 8. This is another great soul winning verse. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, I'm just, it's just for the good cause. You know, I'm just lying about Santa Claus. I know it's not real, but come on. Everybody does it. It's just Santa Claus, right? It's harmless. You know, a good lesson in life that, that I wish I learned a lot earlier was the ends never justify the means. The end never justifies the mean. What does that mean exactly? The end never justifies the means. It means even if you think that you're, you're doing, you know, you're, you're lying today, to try to do good later on, it's never worth it. The Bible way is to always do right, to do right, to tell the truth always. Be right in step A, be right in step B, do what's right in step C, even, and, and let the chips fall where they may at step D, you know, in the, in the end part. The ends never justify the means. It's always worth it to do what's right. And you should never justify lying to children. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 43 <clears throat> John chapter 8, verse 43, this is from uh, Jesus Christ himself. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Who's Jesus talking to here? He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the, the you know, religious leaders, the hypocrites of that time. And, you know, <laughs> he basically says, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father will you do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He bowed not in the truth. He doesn't like the truth. And when he, because there is no truth in him, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. It means the devil can only keep lying. No truth comes out of the devil. Lie after lie after lie after lie. And it's kind of like, have you ever seen kids try to justify why they believe in Santa Claus? Now, I only know from experience, you know, way back in the day when I, all, you know, was the kid that believed in Santa Claus. But they'd say like, well, you know, hey, Johnny, how, how, why does uh, Santa Claus, how can he fly around and, and visit all those houses? They're like, well, he's got really fast reindeer, of course. You know, they just kind of keep perpetrating it. You know, how does he go down those chimneys and be so clean and not be so, not be all dirty? You know, if you've ever seen someone go down a real chimney, we don't really have chimneys in Arizona, but chimneys are filled with soot. People, a chimney sweep, you go in there, sweep the chimney, you're covered in black dust, black powder. How does he keep his suit so clean? You know, a big fat guy like that going down the chimney, you know, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to shoot that guy is what you're going to do. Get out of my house. You know, it's not going to be some, you know, fancy. I mean, the point is, is that, you know, these children, they, they, they just try to justify it. And it's so sad. They, they just say, well, of course, dude, because of this or because of that. I remember when I was standing up for Santa, you know, because I believed in Santa for, for a short time. You know, I said, well, I believe in Santa. I know he exists. Because, you know, my dad and I, we tracked him using GPS on our gateway computer and Windows 95 operating system. You know, that's how I know Santa exists. And I made this big stance, you know, I believe in Santa. And all these other, you know, kids with older kids or older siblings are like, no, he doesn't exist. And I'm like, I know he exists. Somebody lied to me. You know, don't lie to your children. The devil can't stop lying. He lies and lies and lies. And when he speaks of the lie, he speaks of the own. He's the father of it. So ask yourself this, you know, for any, any parents here, you know, say, well, if I lie to my children, am I being more like Christ or am I being more like the devil? If I perpetrate the lie, if I, if I spread the, the doctrine of Santa Claus, if I just enjoy Santa Claus a little bit, come on. Am I being more like Christ or am I being more like the devil? Am I hurting 
you know, children are my helping children. In the long run, you're hurting children. You're confusing them. You're causing them to not trust you. And, and they shouldn't trust you if you're going to tell them about Santa Claus. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Uh, turn to Titus chapter 1, verse 2. This is another great soul winning verse. I use this verse all the time. Titus 1, 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. I want you parents to know that, you know, God obviously cannot lie. And when, when God had gave you his, your children, if God blessed you with children, God has made you, you know, dads in, in particular, the, the deputy, your God's deputy. What does that mean? That means that your relationship with your child is going to be the foundation for how your child's relationship is with God the Father. It's a very critical thing. It's very important that you take care of your children in, in the right way. And God the Father cannot lie. God, I mean, God the Father, Son, and Spirit, the Holy Spirit cannot lie. God cannot lie. And so... When you have a parent lying to their children, encouraging them, believe in Santa Claus, Santa is real, believe in him, that's ultimately like a corrupt picture of God lying to the world, God lying to your children. You know, don't lie to your children. Parents, God entrusted you with your children. You're supposed to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord to teach them what's right and what's wrong. Don't lie to your children. It's, it's never okay to lie to them, not even for Santa Claus. Go ahead and flip over to Matthew chapter 18. I want to really dwell on this because this is the great tragedy, and, and it's no fault to children. It's, no, it's, not a chi it's not a child's fault if he believes in Santa Claus. I, I would say it's the parent's fault. It's the parent's fault for, for allowing it into their home. The child should say, Dad, is Santa Claus real? And the dad should say, no, he's not. <laughs> he should say, no, no, he's not. Don't believe in Santa Claus. It, he's a hoax. You know, he's a myth. He's a false religion. He's a false antichrist. We'll get in that in a second. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. Jesus had a lot to say about little children. Let's see what he says. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is, the, is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little, ch little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto the man by whom the offense cometh. Now, this is the primary application here could just easily be said that, you know, all pedophiles should be put to death. You know, if you're a pedophile in the world, you know, my message to you would be to kill yourself, throw yourself into the ocean, you know, take a big tractor tire and tie it around your neck and throw it in, good riddance, and you'll be doing yourself a favor uh, for the life to come. But, I mean, in that same thing, I mean, that's the primary application here. He's talking about, you know, literally advocating for suicide. I mean, I hope that's clear. The Lord Jesus Christ is advocating for suicide for any pedophiles who would offend a child. But in the same sense, you know, it, 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 well, okay, but let's just lie to him about Santa Claus. <laughs> no. You know, I mean, obviously it's not the same sin. There's a much worse sin there, of course. And we've already mentioned the Santa Clauses and the mall and all that stuff. But the point is, is that you don't want to offend one. You don't want to lie to a child. If that child believes in Christ, you don't want to lie to it. Jump down to verse 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. You know, this is a great proof verse for having a guardian angel. And I believe that if you're saved, if your children are, are, are godly children, if you are saved, if you pray for protection for your child, I believe here, according to this verse, that God, you know, there'd be enough evidence here to say that you'd have a guardian angel watching over you, watching over your child. And I pray that here for all of the children in the room. I pray that for all of the adults, too. I don't know why it would stop. But the point is, is that if you're the kind of person out there who takes one of God's children, someone who's trusting in him, maybe someone who's saved, a little, little saved four-year-old, a saved five-year-old, and you're trying to convince them, hey, 
believe in Jesus, but also believe in Santa. Believe in Jesus, but also believe in this, you know, ho, 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 big jolly fellow. No, don't lie to a child. Don't lie to a, another Christian. Don't lie to anybody. Don't lie. So <clears throat> let me show you something else here because go ahead and flip over to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I want to show you because this is really, really interesting. And, and we're going to get to it. I'm going to build up to it here. But 1 Timothy chapter 1, the Bible talks a lot about not heeding to fables. And what is a fable? Go ahead and flip to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let me read for you the definition of a fable. A fable, this is according to dictionary.com, a fable is a short tale to teach a moral lesson, often with animals or inanimate objects as characters. Another definition is a story not founded on fact. <laughs> Floating reindeer, <laughs> flying, flying sleighs, Red, Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer. A story about supernatural or extraordinary persons. You know, a big fat man that can fit down a skinny chimney. You know, it doesn't make sense. So check a look at this. 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is the Apostle Paul, great apostle, writing to Timothy. Timothy is basically his protege. It's his, um, his son in his faith is what, is what Paul calls him. <clears throat> He's instructing Timothy. He's encouraging him. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, he says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. So he says, neither give heed to fables. Say, well, Brother Jake, let me just come, and I've got a really good fable. I want to preach the fable to the church. No, don't give heed to fables. Or to endless genealogies. That's a separate sermon. Now, what's a genealogy? That's, you know, the son of so and so, son of so, son of, son of. Which minister questions rather than, edly, or that rather than godly edifying, which is, which is in faith, so do. So I want you to notice here, generally speaking, it's often preached that, you know, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions. It's off, you've probably heard it preached where the genealogies minister questions. But I want to show you that there's an and here. So it's the fables and genealogies which minister questions. And I think that that would be the fables also administering questions. And that's basically, well, if Santa's so smart, how does he, you know, build all those toys so fast? <laughs> if Santa's so smart, why does all my presents come from you know, the Sears catalog. If Santa's, if Santa's, you know, so fast, how can he do it, you know, land in every single house and fly back in time? I mean, there's certain questions. You could really pick apart Santa Claus. If you put on your adult mind and think, you know, why does Santa Claus, how can people believe this? It's just, it's just question after question after question. Well, how does the reindeer fly? You know, I don't even, I don't even have the ability to make up what people, how, what do people answer that? Does anybody know how the reindeer is supposed to fly? Magic, yeah, I mean, that's basically magic fairy dust, you know. Who knows? What makes the magic fairy dust so good? You know, I don't know. It's the, it's the, it's the substance. I mean, you can see how it just goes on and on and on. It's endless. Okay, come on now. That's meaningless. He's saying, neither give feed to fables. Don't do it. Let me just read for you a few more. Jump down to verse 7. The same, same uh, sorry, no, chapter 4, verse 7. Uh, so a few pages to the right. Uh, let me just read for you a, a fast montage of what God thinks of fables. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Rather means instead. 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away the ears from the, from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. It's like, oh man, I don't want to hear about Jesus Christ. Oh, tell me more about Santa. You know, we're, we're listening to our, our Christmas music. I hope you all have a Christmas CD, you know, for the hymns. It's like, well, I'm tired of this. Let me hear about, you know, Jingle Bells. You know, oh yeah, let me hear about Santa. Uh, come, I, I don't even know him. Come, here comes Santa Claus. I don't even want to sing it. You say, ah, oh, uh, my itching ears. Let me hear about the fables. Let me read for you Titus chapter 1, verse 13. This witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may, may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So he says, hey, don't even give heed to Jewish fables. Now, I don't know if Santa Claus is a Jewish fable or not, but 
it goes together with a fable. Second Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, by, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So just here's the, the montage, right? Fables, but refuse fables. Uh, uh, they shall turn away their ears and shall be turned unto fables. You know, that's not good. Uh, not giving heed to Jewish fables, uh, which have followed cunningly devised fables. Uh, you know, God, what does God think of fables? You know, basically avoid it, refuse it, uh, uh, don't turn to it. It's negative. It's bad. Fables, 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 bad, bad, bad. What should you do instead? The Bible. Read the Bible, teach the Bible, teach the gospel. Amen. That's what you should do instead. Make Christmas about Jesus. <clears throat> okay, now go ahead and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, because I want to show you, this is the interesting thing that I was, uh, was hinting at from before. 2 Timothy <clears throat> uh, chapter 3, verse 13. But evil men... Verse, th verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. <clears throat> what I want to talk about now is, you know, the obvious fact that children, it's not children's fault that Santa Claus exists. Don't be mad at a child because of Santa Claus. Santa Claus has been, you know, around for many, many years, or, you know, hundreds of years, I'll say. Santa Claus has been around for many years, not because of children, but because of adults. Because adults are encouraging it. Because adults are, you know, passing that baton. Hey, I was tricked by Santa Claus as a child. Now you can be tricked by Santa Claus as a child. <laughs> That's basically what's been happening over and over and over and over. Who started this? Why is it going on? Evil, but evil men, seducers, shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Why do people who were deceived keep deceiving others? You know, it, it's a horrible story, but... I f I f it's a great story because I figured out Santa Claus. I figured it out. And I just went up to my mom. I'm a, I'm a little child. I don't know how old I was, maybe five. And I just went up to her and I'm like, you're Santa Claus. <laughs> and my mom, I love my mom. You know, I hope she forgives me for saying this. But my mom's like, don't tell your brother. <laughs> you know, she just, don't tell your brother. And that's what happens. I'm the older brother. I have a younger brother. My brother's getting married next week. From that point on, now I, for the next year, I lied to my brother about Santa Claus the same way my parents lied to me. And so then it was like, hey, Tommy, Santa's coming. <laughs> you, know, you know, Santa <laughs> better be good. You know, and I, I don't know if I did it that obvious. But the point is, do you see what's happening? Why is Santa still a thing? You know, aren't we supposed to be so smart? You know, at 2020, we're supposed to be so smart. And, you know, we, we've got all this technology. And yet we still believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> You know, it's, it's not good. We still encourage it. We still do all this stuff. It's not good. And so here's the positive example. Jump down to uh, verse 14. Well, yeah, you were on verse 13. Let's read verse 14 together. <clears throat> this is, remember, this is still Paul talking to Timothy. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Verse 15, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now what I want you to know here is that Timothy was saved as a very young person. Timothy was saved as a child. Uh, and the reason why, why was Timothy saved? Why is he becoming a pastor you know, later on? Why is Paul writing to Timothy? Well, if you read the whole book of of First and Second Timothy, you'll see here that Paul commends uh, Timothy's grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice because they decided to teach him the Bible from a very young age. They taught him the Bible. They taught him the Holy Scriptures instead of Santa Claus. You know, obviously they didn't have Santa. They taught him the Bible as a child. And now Timothy is this great man. He, he's taking over a church. He's very young. He's a very young pastor. And I believe he, you know, went out and did a, a great job. I, I, I think he was, you know, probably Paul's number one person. Teach your children the, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, and make them wise unto salvation. Let's change gears here. My third point is Satan's religion will undermine your parenting. Satan's religion will undermine your parenting. Go ahead and turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23. <clears throat> 
Uh, while you're turning there, I'll, I'll read for you Exodus chapter 20. This is another Ten Commandment. Uh, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Children are supposed to honor their father and mother. They're supposed to honor them when they're young. They're supposed to honor them when they're old. You know, when your parents get old and elderly, you're supposed to take them into their house and, and take care of them and honor them and make sure that they, you know, have a chance to meet, you know, their grandchildren and, and, and be a blessing to your home. Let me read for you Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. You know, that means like spanking. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 23, this is where you are, verse 13. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Here's what I want to show you. <clears throat> In the, the false religion of Santa Claus, there, you get this concept of, you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming. That's the song. I actually wrote it down. You better watch out. That's like a warning. You better not cry. Ma, I want what I want. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. They say he's making a list and checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice. Like Santa Claus is some kind of rule keeper, some kind of judge. Hmm. Yeah, no, you're bad, you're bad. Yep, okay, okay, you're good. Here's what, here's what I see happening. Basically, you know, I, I don't know if this has ever happened. I'm sure, I'm sure this has happened. But you've got some toddler, you know, some, some child mouthing off, pouting, you know, throwing a tantrum. Bobby, I want all the candy, I want all the stuff. And they say, you know, little Johnny, you better be calm. Santa Claus is coming. And he says, oh, you're right, Santa Claus is coming. Eventually, the kid's going to figure it out. Eventually, the kid's going to realize, hey, this is delayed. Santa Claus isn't coming for, you know, 60 more days. <laughs> Santa Claus isn't coming. I mean, try that threat on January 1st. You know, Johnny, Santa Claus is coming. Johnny's going to be like, Santa Claus was just here. Santa, he's not coming back for a long time. He's going to forget about this. What I'm trying to show you here is that that's a bad system. If you do that, if you're using the, the empty threat of Santa Claus, because we all know Santa Claus just gives everybody presents. Now, I don't know of anybody who actually got any coal. I mean, maybe you do. I, I don't know. But even then, I mean, coal is still very useful. I mean, you can burn stuff with it. It's still, you know, <laughs> to the right kid, coal is not that bad, <laughs> which is a stupid joke. <laughs> But the point is, is that you don't, when you have children, you don't want to have empty threats. Well, Santa's coming. This kid's are like, well, great. You know, who gives a rip? Santa's coming. You know, Santa's coming. You know, better watch out. Better not pout. The Bible says, you know, you should have instant, you know, discipline. Hey, cut that out. Whack, whack, whack. You give them a little spanking. They shouldn't, your children shouldn't fear Santa Claus. They should fear you. Why? Because you're God's deputy. Why? Because if they fear you, mom and dad, they're going to fear God. If they fear you, they're going to fear their creator. If they honor you, they're going to honor God. It's how, the, it's how God set it up. Now look at this. Uh, let me just read this to you, to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes is a great book. Chapter 8, verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. What this is saying here is basically the, the delayed court case. I mean, this is not against Santa Claus necessarily. This is talking about, ooh, I can commit a crime today, and I'm not going to be caught for like 60 days later, and then I'll have a court case, you know, 60 days after that, and then maybe I'll go to prison after that, and, you know, I'll do the consequences later. And they say, well, maybe it's worth it. I can get away with all this stuff right now. I can do all these crimes now because, you know, punishment is delayed. It's, 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 too, it's far away. And that's why if you're doing this thing of Santa Claus, like, well, Johnny, be good, Santa's coming. You know, Santa, or, or that Johnny's going to look at his calendar and say, listen, Santa's not coming for, you know, so long, so many months or so. I can get away with it. I just, it's not worth it. What I'm trying to say here is that Santa will undermine your authority. Santa basically steps in as this middleman, this awkward, you know, middle, middleman, a middle manager. He's not doing anything. You're saying, oh, yeah, Santa's coming. 
Santa doesn't carry the big spoon. You know, you do, Mom and Dad. You do. You carry that spoon. And we're talking about a light spanking, you know, we're just, just to clarify. <clears throat> so go ahead and, and turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, because there's two sides to this coin. The one side is the whole discipline. The other, you know, di the fear and discipline side. The other side is the reward and blessing side. Luke chapter 11, verse 11. This is Jesus speaking. He's talking about gifts. <clears throat> Luke chapter 11, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's, uh, you know, mostly in, in the right in your Bible. Luke chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them to ask him? Now, let me clarify, the primary interpreta interpretation here is a Christian, you know, asking the Heavenly Father, their Father, uh, if you believe on Christ, you're a son of God, a daughter of God, asking Him for the, for the Holy Spirit, which is something you, everybody should do. You know, when you get up in the morning, you should say, Lord, today's a new day, please fill me with your Holy Spirit and, and help me to live in the Spirit. That's the primary application here. But Jesus is using a parable or an analogy of, of a parent giving a gift to a child. And I just want to say this, you don't have to, to have an occasion to give a gift to your child. You can give them a gift whenever you want, Mom and Dad. You don't have to wait for Christmas. You can just give them the gift. Why? Because you love them. You can just give them a gift. Oh, you're my son? Here's a gift for you. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing wrong with just giving them a gift at any time, for any reason. Just give them a gift. The same thing with your wife with roses. You can just give her a rose. Just give her flowers. Same thing. What I want to show you is that don't let Santa steal credit for your gift. Very simple concept here. We all know who paid for that gift. Why is some mythical creature, Santa Claus, getting the credit for it? Why is, you know, hey, you better be good because Santa's going to come. Well, nuts to you, Mom and Dad. I like Santa. Santa's the one I should be fearing. Santa doesn't tell me what to do. You know, and then Santa comes and gets this. Well, hey, Mom, you got me nothing. Santa did. You know, thank you, Santa. And it's nothing worse than a child, you know, going and writing the letter to Santa. Dear Santa, I want this, I want this. You should ask your parents for those things. Go to your parents for those things. You know, or the worst is if you ever have to send Santa a thank you card. Dear Santa, thank you very much for my gift this year. I promise to be good. You know, why don't you say thank you to your parents? Give your parents the credit. They gave you the gift. Honor your father and mother. Don't let Santa steal credit. Santa will undermine your authority. He'll undermine your parenting. On one side, through the discipline. On the other side, through the reward. And you should reward your children uh, if they're good. There's nothing wrong with that. But a reward is earned. A gift is free, just so we're clear. So let me show you this example because there's... Go ahead and go to Mark chapter 7. I found an example here that's basically the exact inverse opposite of, of what we just described. And that's a, that's a mouthful. Check this out. Mark chapter 7. Matthew, Mark chapter 7. We're talking about giving gifts. Don't let Santa, Santa take credit for your gift. <clears throat> Mark chapter 7. Now this is basically reversed. I'm going to have to kind of interpret this for you or kind of show you the opposite way. Mark chapter 7 verse 10. Uh, <clears throat> for Moses said, remember, this is Jesus speaking. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother. And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. Which, let me pause there again, Jesus is advocating for the death penalty for anybody who curses their father and mother. You know, that's not the hippie Jesus that the world will tell you about. That's very bold. I mean, that's what the, law, that's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus said. But verse 11, but, I, but ye say, but ye say, now he, he's saying, but ye say, meaning he's talking to the Pharisees, the hypocrites. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban which that is to say it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me he shall be free and ye shall suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have de 
delivered, and many such things do ye. Now here's the picture. Make sure you don't miss this. What Jesus is saying here, and here's, here's what's happening. The Pharisees at the time had this little scheme going around. The Bible says, honor your father and mother. Now, a, par- a child is supposed to honor their parents as a young child. And when their parents become elderly, they're supposed to honor their parents when they become older. And that means taking them into their house. That could mean, you know, just giving them some money every week. You know, Here, here's some money, Dad. Here's some money, Mom. You know, buy yourself some groceries or something. It could mean something like that. And it doesn't give specifics, but it could mean like that. What the Pharisees figured out is they said, hey, you know, our people are doing this service. They're giving money to their parents. But what if we can convince them or trick them? Instead of giving money to your parents, donate that money to us, to the temple or to the Pharisees or to whatever Pharisee society charity that they had going on. Does that make sense? It's kind of like, hey, instead of you giving the money to your parents, like the Bible says, just give us the money as a gift to us, and we'll give you this receipt. It's kind of like when you get on Christmas that gift, you know, a, chari- a charitable donation has been made for $25 to some fund. Here's your receipt. <laughs> you know, nobody knows what I'm talking about, but that's like a worst nightmare for any kid. You get this receipt saying you have donated $25 to some charity. It's like, great, thank you. <laughs> I feel so good. This is kind of what's happening here. I mean, basically, the Pharisees have, have tricked these people. Maybe not, maybe not all of them, but some of them. They tricked them saying, hey, instead of the children giving gifts to their parents, give the gift to the Pharisee instead and leave your parents high and dry with nothing, Don't, uh, dishonoring them. And Jesus is calling them out you know, through their tradition, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. This is basically the reverse scenario. You know, a parent is giving a, a, a gift to a, a child. It's the inverse re- reverse scenario. Don't let Santa steal your gifts to your children. A child says, oh, thank you, Santa. It'd be kind of like if the parent you know, were to give the gift to Santa and then Santa gives the gift to them. It's just this whole convoluted mess. Don't, you don't need it. Don't, all I'm trying to say is you don't need Santa to give gifts to your children. He's a mythical creature. He doesn't exist. Let's move on. <laughs> okay, go to, John, for, go to 1 John chapter... 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> I want to switch gears again here. The false religion of Santa Claus, in the false religion of Santa Claus, Santa is an antichrist. What does that mean to be an antichrist? An antichrist is somebody who's you know, like Christ, uh, someone who's trying to uh, exalt themselves as Christ. <clears throat> antichrist. A lot of people think antichrist means like like the enemy of Christ, and he is the enemy of Christ, but anti basically is like a, in this context, it's basically like a, like a, a impersonator, like somebody wearing a mask, you know, are you the real Jesus? No, I'm, I'm the fake Jesus, I'm antichrist, does that make sense? He's a, he's a false Jesus, people are going to think the antichrist is Jesus, and that's what people think of Santa, I mean, Santa is a version of an antichrist. First John chapter 2, verse 18, little children, it is, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrist. Santa's one of them. Whereby we know that it is the last time. We're going to change gears here in the sermon, and we're going to look at Santa's attack on Jesus, Santa's impersonation of Jesus. <clears throat> you know, Santa says, he sees you when you're sleeping. Sorry, I don't want to sing it. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. People could, you know, children could be thinking that Santa sees everything, right? Like he knows what's going on. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake and when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. That's how the song goes. This, this, this power of knowing everything is, is only, you know, f- only divine. Only God knows everything at once. God knows your thoughts. God knows everything. He's watching everything. Only God knows this. Santa doesn't know. Santa couldn't, doesn't know his way out of a paper bag. Say, you know, Santa's an idiot. <clears throat> let me read for you. Well, let me prove this to you. Go ahead and go to back to Matthew. I'm sorry I'm having you flip all around. Go back to Matthew and you'll see this for yourself. I want to show you here that Jesus knows everything. Santa doesn't. Only, only God knows that. Only Jesus knows that. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> verse 1 of 
Verse 1, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came unto his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemous, blaspheme, blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. So I, I hope you caught that there. Jesus in verse 4, and Jesus knowing their thoughts. This is really interesting. There's only one person. I mean, there's only one uh, deity. That's Jesus Christ. He's a thought reader. He's a mind reader. He knows your thoughts. Santa Claus doesn't know your thoughts. There's no human way. Even if you were to trace the tradition of Santa Claus, which is very different from, you know, St. Nicholas, he was just a human being. He didn't know anybody's thoughts. But Jesus does know your thoughts. And so, you know, it doesn't make any sense to pray to Santa Claus or to write him letters or to wish something of Santa Claus. You should pray to Jesus. He knows your thoughts. You can pray to him. He knows when you're sleeping. There's so many more verses I could have put in here to prove this point. But if you read the Bible cover to cover, you're going to find that God knows everything. He knows your thoughts. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. There's so many other ways I could have, I could have shown you this. Let me show you, uh, if you don't mind, go back to, go to Revelation chapter 20. I want to show you something here because <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20 we're going to show you that they both have lists. You've heard Santa say he, he's making a list and checking it twice. Going to find out who's naughty and nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list. Well, you know, that's great. He's making a list, not naughty or nice. <laughs> Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So put that on your list, Santa. <laughs> There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, we don't need a list, Santa Claus. James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. That means that even if you are 99% good, a really good person, you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. Naughty list, naughty list, naughty list, the whole world. I mean, and it's not called, you know, the naughty list. You know, God doesn't call it the naughty list. <clears throat> Jesus has a list of his own, though. And let me show you, Revelation chapter 20 uh, verse 11, <clears throat> this is John when he was uh, brought up into heaven. At Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. What a great uh, sentence. I mean, this is the very end of the Bible. This is Revelation chapter 20. The picture here is what's what we commonly call the great white throne judgment. This is where, you know, basically uh, the dead are brought up. And, you know, the, the dead are, are brought again to the great white throne judgment where they're going to be judged out of the books. You know, let's see what you've done. Let's see what, you know, what kind of punishment you get in hell. These people are not saved. I saw the dead, small and great. <clears throat> and the books were opened, and another one was opened. There's two books here, if you notice that. And the books were opened. I believe the, the first books there are the law. I believe it's the Levitical law. And the other book was opened. I mean, it, it's the Bible, basically. And the other book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So this is a... a, a I'm hoping you can see here that this is serious business. The day of the great white throne judgment is serious business. It's literally, you know, heaven or hell. And this is the dead being judged for their work. So this is pretty much all hell if you're being judged on the great white throne, where the, the believers won't be judged like this because Christ wipes away all your sins. But what I want to show you here is that Santa Claus is basically making a mockery at this, making a list checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. Where does this list come from? Who thought of that? Why would there be some list of who's naughty and nice? 
if it wasn't a knock on the Bible, if it wasn't, you know, some sort of uh, fabrication, some sort of light preaching from the Word of God, it's basically, you know, Christianity light is what they're trying to make it. Does that make sense? It's a false religion. And many people today, unfortunately, would rather believe in Santa Claus God than to believe in Jesus Christ, you know, the God of the Bible, the creator of heaven and earth. And it's interesting if you ask, you know, if you go up to, you know, if you're knocking on doors and, you know, a sodomite opens the door, and maybe you don't know if they're a sodomite or not, you know, say, hey, do you believe in God? They'll say, well, you know, yeah, I believe in God. They'll, you know, say, of course they do. Say, well, do you believe in the God of the Bible that says sodomite should be put to death? And they'll be like, oh, no, my God will never do that. Well, that's because they have, you know, the Santa Claus God. They have the light, fluffy God, the ho, ho, ho God. It's not good. And there's many other ways. I mean, I'm leaving out so many other examples. You could talk about, uh, you know, Santa going down the burning chimney. Jesus Christ, you know, he went into hell for three days and three nights, and he came back out and resurrected the glory. You know, Jesus, Santa goes down the chimney, eats your cookies, and comes back up. You know, it's not the same. It's Antichrist. It's, it's close, but no cigar. It's, it's different. I mean, that's just a phrase. What I want to say here is that, you know, it, it's, it's an Antichrist. Let me read for you John chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 3. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the, sh into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. This is a great verse here, because this is showing us that if you are just like Jesus, you're Jesus light, it's wrong, it's false. There's only one true way, there's only one true thing. If you, if you, Jesus is the door, he that entereth by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus said, I am the door, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. I'm paraphrasing. So if somebody climbs in the other way, let's say you have a sheepfold, and you've got the door, and somebody climbs in the other way. Think about your house, right? If you come into my house by some other way other than the front door, you're there for the wrong reason. If, you're, if I catch you climbing in through the window into my house, I mean, you're a bad person. You, I don't know what you're up to. That's, that's bad. And what the Bible's saying here is that if you are basically, you know, trying to steal away from the fold or trying to climb into some false religion or some, some sort of thing or trying to approach heaven and hell through Santa Claus religion. It's false. It's wrong. And this could be said for more than just Santa Claus. I mean, this, is, this could be said for Lord of the Rings or for Star Wars. You know, people would say, I, I read a book once as a child, you know, Finding God in Lord of the Rings. You know, and, and they, they made the comparison that Aragorn, which I hope none of you know, Aragorn is like Jesus because Frodo, you know, that's false. That's an antichrist. I, I mean, that's n it has nothing to do with anything. Or my, the worst one that people probably know is, is the, the, the Chronicles of Narnia. The Chronicles of Narnia. What does that have to do with anything about the Bible? The, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. What does this have to do with anything? There's nothing there. It's very silly. It's, it's stupid. Santa Claus is the same way. It's this, it's this wannabe false religion that's just meaningless. It's empty. It's hollow. <clears throat> but I have one more thing that I want to point out. <clears throat> Santa Claus. Who is he? <clears throat> go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter... Well, actually, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Santa Claus. I want to try to change your perception of Santa Claus in the sense that, you know, when the world sees Santa Claus, when, when the world, if you view Santa Claus from the eyes of the world, they would see basically, a, you know, a big fat jolly man with rosy cheeks, with a big beard, carrying a big, you know, bag of toys. I want to try to change your image of Santa Claus. I'm hoping that this sermon and, and the, the things that I've shown you here, you can see Santa Claus for what he really is. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me, while you're turning there, I'll read for you Revelation 20, 10. 
And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. What I want to tell you here is that the devil is a deceiver. The devil is not direct. Hi guys, I'm the devil. I hate you all. I want to take you to hell. Let's go. Come on. He's not direct like that. The devil is a deceiver. The devil, you know, would wear many masks. The devil wants you to think, you know, if I ask you think of the devil right now, you're probably thinking of, you know, the, 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 the classic man in the bodysuit with the pitchfork. You know, I mean, that's, that's not the devil. And the devil wants you to think that that's the devil. You know, the guy in the tights with the pitchfork, you know, ah, that's not the devil. That's not what the devil looks like. But there's something else, you know, there's someone else in a big red suit who I want to try to steer your picture as more accurate. Who is more like the devil? Santa Claus. Santa Claus, these false religions. I mean, this is an antichrist. That's what I'm trying to show you. And the devil that deceived them, the devil's a deceiver. He's not, he doesn't say, oh, I hate you. Ah. He says, ho, 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 come get my gifts. Oh, here's a gift for you and you and you. Better not be naughty. Ho, ho. The world loves Santa Claus. He deceives the whole world. When, when you think of the devil at Christmas time, I want you to think of that Santa Claus face. You know, he's on people's yards, deceiving people, lying to children. The man in the red suit, picture of the devil. I know it's a bold thing to say, but that's, that's more accurate. I mean, I'm not saying that he's literally, that's what the devil looks like. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that that's a more accurate picture. The, the man, you know, Sparky, the ASU mascot, or Santa Claus. I'm going to say Santa Claus is more evil. I mean, that's, that's the reality. Let me show you why I can say that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. <clears throat> Paul is trying to warn uh, the church at, uh, in, uh, of the Corinthians. He's trying to warn the, the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. For such, are su for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. It's a very scary thought to think, but Satan is, him, he says, and no marvel, verse 14, and no marvel, that means, that means don't be surprised. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You know, I don't know if you have a Mormon temple here in Tucson, but we have like three of them in, in Mesa. Is there one here? There's lots. Well, the Mormon churches, but also the temples, right? The big temples that have, you know, they say we serve the God of this world right on the side of it with a lowercase g. It's like, oh. The Mormon temples, you know, if you're driving by, you'll see, wow, it's beautiful. I mean, from the flesh, right? Wow, big, big bright, big building. The lights are shining on it. Maybe a Catholic church, the stained glass window, so beautiful. You look up at the ceiling, you know, the chapel and the painted artwork. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. It's the devil. It's the devil's temple. You know, it's very scary. It, it, it's, 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 it's a doctrine to enslave people. It's not good. And so why would Santa Claus be any different? You say, well, come on, he's harmless. He's not harmless, you know, from what we've seen today. It's not harmless at all. You say, oh, ho, ho, I just have a big bag of toys here. Ha, ha, it's so fun. There's way more. You're, you're, if you invite Santa Claus into your, into your house and, and Santa Claus into your, your Christmas season, your holiday season, you're asking for way more trouble, especially as a Christian person, especially with Christian children. So <clears throat> what can we learn from this? Number one, teach your children what a free gift means. Teach them what a gift is. Give them a gift. You don't have to work for it, son. Here's a free gift. Merry Christmas. Number two, parents, don't lie to your kids. Don't lie to them. Don't lie to any child ever. There's no, why do it? Don't do it. You know, if you're a child and, and you have friends who believe in Santa Claus, you know, I, I want to I tell you, you know, go tell them Santa Claus doesn't exist. You can get away with it. Just tell them. Now, a parent, you probably, you know, I would tell you the same thing too. Stand for truth all the time, but you're probably going to, you know, make your relatives very angry, especially if they're not saved, if they're not Christian. But if they're Christian, I mean, by all means, show them, show them these verses. But I want to encourage kids and parents, pity kids who are being lied to by their parents. Pity them. And 
you know, the whole Santa Claus battle is not really the battle to fight or, or to die on. Give them the gospel. Just skip Santa Claus for now. Give them the gospel. Get them saved. Give them eternal life. That's the best gift you could actually give anybody on Christmas. And we should be doing more soul winning. And I find that people are more receptive during Christmas time. And you've got that CD. You can say, hey, I'm just dropping off a, a, a music CD. It's our church. It's a, it's a hymnal or a hymn, CD of hymns. You can use, you know, hey, do you have a church to go to on, on Christmas Eve? Do you have a church for Christmas time this year? You can use that as an excuse to, to talk to them. It gives you a different purpose. It's a nice vacation from your normal, you know, 11 months out of the year where you're just inviting people to church. Use it, you know, have pity on them. Have pity on children who believe in Santa Claus. Just give them the gospel. And most importantly, when you see a fat, jolly man wearing the hat, I want you to remember it's a picture of the devil. He's not a picture. I mean, it, it, that's how the devil works. That's how the devil, you know, gets into you. He, he, he's so friendly. Ho, ho, ho. You know, that is how the devil operates. And lastly, let's decide to make Christmas about Jesus. He's the Messiah, the Christ, Christmas. It's about the Messiah. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Make Christmas about Jesus Christ. And what does that mean? That means have Christmas traditions. You know, go caroling. Sing the, sing the, the, the Christmas hymns. That means on Christmas Eve, you know, if you're looking for something to do, read the, read the birth story. Read Luke chapter 2. It's a great story. Take turns reading it. You can do popcorn. Make Christmas about Christ and forget about the man in the red suit, Santa Claus. Let's pray.